This is your last call for my wife, the dietitian. The show is just about to start. Come on, let's go. Hurry up. I'm trying. I can't get my shoe on. Welcome to My Wife, the Dietitian, a fun weekly podcast about nutrition and healthy lifestyle. I'm Rob, and together with my wife, Sandra, we invite you to join us on this informative and entertaining journey through the complex world of healthy eating. Join us each week as we strive to help you with transforming your overall health and relationship with food through up-to-date, evidence-based nutrition information. Today we're talking to chef and general manager Brent Blake all about the ins and outs of the restaurant industry and getting his insights on what it's like to be a chef in this high-paced environment. It's a tough day to day, but uh, when I was a chef, you, you meet a lot of unique individuals, and it I, it always kind of reminded me of you know either a pirate ship or the the island of lost toys, I think it was, or misfits <laughs> island of lost, lost misfits. Was it like, right? Is that Pinocchio or Ray, Ray, uh, Rudolph? I can't remember which one it was coming yeah, from. Yeah, yeah, something like that. Uh, yeah, you know, it's but everybody seems to come together. Everyone's a little bit off the rocker, uh, and I I say that. Uh, with a lot of compassion because it <laughs> right. requires that in order to do what those people do. So, Stay with us for this fascinating interview with Brent from behind the scenes in the kitchen. It's Rob and Sandra, and you are listening to My Wife the Dietitian. Hey, Rob. Oh, hello, Sandra. I'm really stoked about this interview with Brent. Who's, who's Brent? Brent Blake is the general manager of the Cobblestone Pub. Yes, he is. I'm just joking. I know Brent's a good friend of ours. Yeah, he's been a chef for over 20 years and oh, he makes such good food for the potlucks we go to with him. And we get a look behind the scenes. We look at what's happening in the kitchen of a busy restaurant and pub and all the uh, various aspects of the chefs and what they have to deal with under pressure in the heat of the kitchen. Absolutely. Yeah, we thought it would be a different a different perspective, just being able to talk to Brent and get, uh, get his insights on the restaurant industry. He's had a lot of experience in different places, and uh, I thought it would be an interesting thing to share with everyone, so... Oh, yeah. And just like hearing about like chicken wings and where they came from, like just the history of the chicken wing and when it's one of the favorite items on pub fair. Yeah. Lots of good stories coming up. So stay with us. Hi, we're here today with Brent. And Brent, tell us who you are and what you do. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, first of all, thanks so much for having me on. Uh, this is a really neat opportunity, uh, especially with the two of you. My name is Brent Blake. Uh, for 20 years, I was a chef, well, a cook and chef for about 15 years. And I've recently graduated, I'll say, into a general manager role of a restaurant that I'm working at on Vancouver Island. Awesome. And that's, yeah, where we're at right now. And what restaurant are you working at or managing? It's called the Cobblestone Pub. It's in Cobble Hill, midway between Nanaimo and Victoria. Nice. Yeah, it's a mainstay in the community. We have our 40th anniversary coming up this weekend on Sunday. It's oh, going to be the pub. quite the quite the to do. Yeah, it's uh, it's survived many years and ups and downs. A fire. Wow, that's amazing. Um, in, included in all of that. So, it's wow. uh, the community support has kept that place alive. And it's continued to evolve even from the time I first got there. So it's it's pretty neat. That is incredible. I, yeah, because I mean, that's some key elements of a good pub is like the community focus, like some place where I'm I'm thinking of the the show Cheers, you know, where everyone knows your name. You well, know? <laughs> quite honestly, that's sort of our uh, our shtick as well. That's what we're aiming for. Um, and pretty much everybody that in there does know each other's name. <laughs> oh, yeah. It's not a, a large community, Cobble Hill. However, the the amount of people moving into the community from Victoria and other areas that are a little bit more out of people's price range has brought a lot of new faces into the pub as well. And it's, uh, yeah, it really is just a, a family feel. A lot of the community people just call it home when you ask them what to call it. So it, it's pretty neat. That is so awesome. So I bet this 40th anniversary this weekend will be pretty, uh, It'll be busy. Like there'll be a ton of people coming and and just seeing the event and just basically to celebrate. 
Oh, absolutely. I think it's going to be off the hook. It, uh, we've got a lineup of about five bands all outside, and then there's an after party inside the pub later on in the night as well with another lineup uh-huh. of three or four bands. It's oh, uh, awesome. Beer gardens, liquor, wine, and beer tastings from a few different vendors throughout the island. We've got barbecue inside, got the restaurant inside. Yeah, it's going to be quite the day. We're all pretty awesome. excited about it. Wow. And you have a big role. I mean, as a general, like, so you were a a chef and cook for years and now you're the general manager. So -hmm. you have to kind of know like the operations of the front of staff and the back, like in the kitchen and kind of be the facilitator between the two and kind of oversee all operations. Like, wow, that's a, it's like a, what are they called when you're on the uh, airline Oh, I was thinking of the guy in the circus. Oh, yeah. <laughs> the, the ringleader. Yeah, pretty right. much, right? Totally. I mean, there you go. I should get you, you to write my job description, Sandra, because you nailed it on the head. That was perfect. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Well, the air traffic controller, that's there what I meant is. to yeah, say. Right? Yeah, there yeah, there's go. a lot of moving parts. That's yeah. right. Well, that's actually, that brings us to our first question. Um, like, how do you balance the requests from customers, like your loyal fans and your the community, with the supply and the food budget? We all know that the food prices are skyrocketing. Mm-hmm. Plus, just to keep your chefs and your cooks happy and, you know, maybe have them uh, have some input into the, the menu options and the way that the method of preparation and stuff, like how does, like, this is a huge job. Like, how do you balance it all? Well, it's, it's pretty tricky to be honest with you, Sandra. It's a a fine line of, yeah, you know, keeping people happy and trying to progress forward with offerings and, and, and not to get stagnant in any fashion, especially in a larger city or population area, like a city of Victoria, you have a lot of different restaurants all over the place offering different types of cuisine and whether it, it's, you know, Vietnamese or you've got uh, your Japanese restaurants and you've got your fine dining restaurants and your Italian restaurants. Uh, and then you get into smaller communities where, you know, you have people coming in the door pretty much every single day. So it, they develop their favorites, right? And the smaller venues, it's to try and change menus up. It's a little bit tricky because if you go and pull someone's favorite thing off the menu, then they're like, well, Where's You'll my hear about Where's it. my thing? Right? Exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, they they almost it's almost like a sense of entitlement to a certain extent. But when you have yeah. someone coming in five days a week, you have to For keep 40 that appeal. Years. Right? Yeah, absolutely. Right. <laughs> right. Um, so it, it is a little bit tricky, but it's the the industry changes so quickly as well, especially in in Canada. Like we we try and draw inspiration. You know, California always seems to be, or the states always seem to be about five years ahead on a lot of different uh, trends, um, right. and including food. So, I mean, trying to, again, I guess, broaden your, your horizon with regards to what you're looking at to see what you can offer and still keep those uh, personal favorites of people. The cost of food is really, really has affected the amount of diners we do see. I mean, personally, in our own space, you know, we're, we're fortunate where we are because we do have a great community support. Um, but, you know, when when a burger goes from, I don't know, 15 to... 22 bucks it's a tough pill to swallow for a lot of people and and that really does impact bottom lines for a lot of different uh, restaurants and venues yeah no bet. kidding yeah and and backing up when you said about like the trends from you know california and different places mm-hmm. are you talking about like maybe like more vegetarian or gluten free or being like you know allergy aware and then maybe having more of a customer um you know people requesting certain items that maybe the the people that have been going there for 40 years don't want to necessarily see their items you know changing and so it's kind of that that hard balance again yeah absolutely i th- i think you hit the the nail on the head there yeah i mean especially uh, nowadays, with the increase of you know people with celiac or gluten intolerances, or I mean, I can even rhyme off some of the sort of I'll say absurd, but that's probably the wrong word uh, types of allergies. I don't think it's absurd at all, Brent. <laughs> <laughs> There's, you know, the things that have started to pop up, and you know, I don't have any real proof, but I think there's a lot of stuff that goes into our foods that probably helps. Uh, I don't know, create some of these issues that people are are finding absolutely uh, within their bodies right i mean yeah i don't know i when i started cooking i never heard of gluten being a problem for anybody right Uh, oh my god 22 years ago and now almost everybody has an intolerance it seems and yeah uh, again i don't know exactly where that comes from uh whether that's always been there or if it's the way things are produced now but it certainly has become more prevalent 
and our cooking for sure. Yeah. Oh my gosh. I bet. And there's just more demand, right? Like you even see it in the grocery store where there's whole sections of gluten-free or vegetarian. And Mm -hmm. I mean, obviously there's a ripple effect in offerings in restaurants too. So having, being the general manager and having those requests from customers and having, you know, to kind of either get the chefs to become on board with, okay, we have to use these ingredients and this has to be like peanut free. So like can't, you know, cross contaminate, like that's just mm-hmm. a whole, oh, can of worms for the general manager. Oh, absolutely. And, and, and talk about left field, Rob, like you said earlier, I mean, most, I'll say most restaurants, cause I don't know all of them, but take great care and making sure there's no cross contamination. And, you know, if there's an allergy that comes to us, there's definitely the process of everything gets pulled fresh from the cooler and prepared fresh on a different cutting board and um, hands get washed properly, uh, surfaces get washed properly. But, you know, if you're in the middle of a, a very busy dinner service and then someone has to leave the line or the space where they're preparing to go do something else, it, it does add a little bit of a kink into the whole process of things. Not that it's not doable. However, there's a fine line between interrupting the flow of things in anything, I suppose, but definitely in the middle of a, a massive, say, Friday night rush. Yeah. yeah, for sure. For sure. Oh, absolutely. And have you worked in places where the kitchen... Um, I was just talking to a chef uh, the other day because I work in long-term care and mm-hmm. and there's, um, you know, cooks in the kitchen and it's a completely different speed of like the environment is just kind of very um, routine day after day versus a busy restaurant or a pub. I mean, you guys are like high energy, like there's just so much going on. And uh, have you have you seen differences in different kitchens? Yeah, every single one's pretty unique. <laughs> um, there's a lot of similarities, no doubt, but it, it really comes down to organization and 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 how how well things are set up to progress throughout the day. And you know, it kind of comes down to like there's about 50 different checklists that need to get run through uh, any given day just to kind of make sure that everything's set up properly, things are prepared properly. You know, um, yeah. the the systems are all running in in the right spot. And, and I guess communication too, eh? Just absolutely, between absolutely. staff and yep. management, and, and that's everybody. that's the uh, that's the biggest piece. I think that you know I, I heard it once, uh, and I, I think my wife and I were having we weren't communicating properly, and uh, I, I'd read something and it said the biggest myth about communication is that it actually happened. It was something along those lines, <laughs> yeah. and I thought about that. I was like, oh, <laughs> that's right. That that hits home, especially in this moment. So, uh, bringing it back into the the restaurant realm. Yeah, there's so many things to try and, and communicate uh, through an entire day, a shift, week, that uh, it, it's it's pretty key to have very good communicators uh, in the right positions to be able to make sure that everything is flowing properly. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, sometimes you get some, uh, I mean, I just watching like some of those cooking shows on TV, you get some big personalities <laughs> in the kitchen. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> you certainly do. I would say that the uh, cooking show ones are a little bit exaggerated. Yeah. Uh, or like, I think they aim to be exaggerated for sure, yeah, for uh, sure. just for the, uh, the effect. But yeah, it, it's, it's a, especially in the kitchen realm, it's uh it's a very high stress environment. I think it's like top three in the most stressful uh, careers that you could possibly have wow. depending on what list you look at, but it's certainly. Really? Uh, I believe uh, yeah, it. Yeah. Holy um, crap. Well, it's fast paced, right? It's, it's, it's fast urgent. paced, long hours. Most chefs don't eat during the day because there just isn't time. Um, <sighs> You know, and it's just go, 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 go. And then you might get a small lull, but then you, you have, you know, you have 50, 50 bills in your window and then you have uh, a waitress coming up talk, trying to ask about, is there, I don't know, <laughs> nightshades in this particular <laughs> product? Right. And it's like, uh, I have no clue. <laughs> right. So uh, We're doing an episode on that, Rob. Yeah. Nightshades and arthritis. <laughs> I saw I saw this clip the other day. It was so funny, and it was this it was of this waitress, and she walks up to a window and she says, "Customer at table five would like an eggless omelet." And the chef looks at at her and he says, "I'm I'm sorry, well we can't do that, can we?" And she says, "Why do we not have any?" Do we not have any? He should have just given her an empty said, plate. Well, he did eventually. He sprinkled or sprinkled some parsley on it. He's like, "Here you go." 
That's awesome. <laughs> it was meant to be a parody, but it was funny Absolutely. because those are the types of things that you encounter, and it's it's no fault to anybody. But it's like if you don't know, you don't know, and it always happens at the most inopportune time. Yeah, exactly, yeah. exactly. Yeah, it's good to be able to laugh about it. That's for sure. Uh, it, you can only Without, laugh like, after it afterwards. Offending the customer, right? <laughs> right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Oh my gosh. That's funny. Well, well, that's funny because that, that was my other question is like, what's a snapshot of the chef's role? We got a little bit of a story from that. but <laughs> Yeah, no, I mean, it's a, it's a massive role for anybody mm-hmm. to undertake. I mean, it takes quite a few years of, of training technically, and then probably a lifetime of training on the job just to continue to keep your skills sharp. But then, you know, it's a very unforgiving profession. In, in that regard, you know, there's a lot, there's quite a few fortunate people who are able to find themselves the money to open up their own thing or work long enough to put something aside to be able to do their own thing. But that isn't the norm. That is not the norm. My apologies. And it, yeah, I mean, it's a really hard grind and it takes a, a unique individual to be able to sustain, I'll say the abuse for long yeah, 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 yeah. periods of time. <laughs> um, and so it, uh, you know, but it's, it's a really... It's challenging, but it's rewarding at the same time, Spe- sure. you know, if it comes down to, especially if the chef is in a position where he is able to use his skills and creativity to, you know, build menus. There's certain environments where that doesn't happen. If you're looking at large corporate chains type of thing, they have a group of people in their head office making the menus. So you just end up becoming a bit of a glorified line cook at that point <sighs> and running numbers. And that that's certainly a passion killer. And is it kind of like faster, cheaper? We got to do it faster, cheaper. Absolutely. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Um, do more with less, right? More with less. <laughs> yeah. Right. Right. Like, like everything. Yeah. Yes. Absolutely. So you know, yeah, it's it's a tough day to day. But uh, when I was a chef, I always, you know, it was you, you meet a lot of unique individuals, um, and it I, it always kind of remind me of you know either a pirate ship or the the Island of Lost Toys, I think it was, or Misfits, <laughs> Island of Lost, Lost Misfits. Was it right. the, was that Pinocchio or Ray, Ray, uh, Rudolph? I can't remember which one it was coming yeah, from. Yeah, but, something like that. Uh, yeah, you know, it's but everybody seems to come together. Everyone's a little bit uh, off the rocker. Uh, and I, I say that uh, with a lot of compassion because it right, requires right. that in order to do what those people do. So Absolutely, because yeah, no. maybe, maybe they're introverted. Like, is that what you mean? Like, maybe they're more well, introverted sure. people? I mean, there's, you know, I, I can't even classify it into that. I mean, because you've got some extreme extroverts as well. And I think the extroverts are the ones who are generally the ones leading things because they have the yeah. energy to keep pushing forward. And But yeah, I mean, I think there's a massive spectrum there that people fall into um, with regards to personalities. And, you know, I think at one point, if you weren't like a, a trained chef, you're a criminal or an ex-con, <laughs> something like that, just right. out. Uh but from some of the history I've read, people who do it should be very proud if they can, um, yeah. because it's not everybody can stand there for 12 hours a day and, and oh. keep their cool or keep their head long enough to make sure that the guest has had the best experience they possibly could. Oh, yeah, exactly. totally. And when you said keep their cool, that's really good analogy. Well, because it's like it's that they got the steam in their face yeah, and right, you know, yeah. <laughs> opening hot ovens. And then they've got all these, the front of house staff coming in and saying, Oh, I need an eggless omelet. Or This exactly. needs to be no nightshades. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Cook is like, my God, I have to like think on my feet here. Like I got to look and like Google what the heck's a nightshade. Right. <laughs> it's it like, a- I don't have time to go computer. <laughs> <laughs> Does anybody know what a nightshade is? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. It's like, exactly. They're not, when you said that the people in the head office are making the menus and whatever, it's like they're sitting at the desk, they're on their computer, whereas the chefs and the cooks are doing the work. They're actually like on the front of the line in terms of like they're making the food and, you know, it has to, I think, as you mentioned, like if they're just a, anyone can do it, that doesn't give them um, much um, pleasure. And I mean, an element has to be creativity, I would think. Like they have to have their own little flair to feel proud of because part of it is, you know, presenting the food and being proud of, you know, their creation. And if they're just kind of making it because that's what head office says, this is the menu, this is what we got to do. It's, I don't know. It's just, uh, that's a, I'm wondering how, how you've 
how you keep them inspired. Is that yeah, kinda, yeah, like with the creativity element. Yeah, you know, it, it, like you said, especially with a, a corporate environment, it does, and I kind of alluded to it previously. It, it does kind of kill the passion because it it is basically conveyor belt, yeah, assembly line. There it is, right? Uh, yeah. And you're just kind of repeating the same thing over and over again. And, and regardless of the corporate world or you know independent, that is sort of the life of a line cook. So I, I guess to try and keep the passion alive, it, it comes down to the leader, you know, always fine tuning things like, you know, you need to tighten that up a little bit or trying to coach the individuals, especially if they're a younger individual and, and learning just to try and bring the best out of them each time they touch that uh, item. And, you know, it, there's always something you could do a little bit better. And that's the thing. I mean, especially when you get moving too quickly, you know, things can get a little bit sloppier. So having the, the discipline to kind of bring it back in and, and focus properly to do that, right? Because consistency is the name of the game. And, you know, if someone had, I'll say, a beef dip somewhere and it was incredible and they go back and it wasn't as incredible, they'll, you know, there's a lack of consistency there. And then they kind of, well, maybe they'll order something else or start, you know, telling people, you know what, I had it once, but the second time it wasn't that great. But that was, I'm getting away from your initial question with regards to how to keep people inspired with creativity. <laughs> uh, a lot of the great places that, I've been involved in we've we have our mainstay menu items but then we run a lot of features as well so that's where you can get the the younger junior chefs involved and you know they can practice their skills and what they've learned and so that it doesn't become too stagnant because yeah i mean when it's repetitive over and over again and you're just sweating all day doing the same thing it's not so, that much fun yeah <laughs> yeah, yeah right absolutely thing. yeah and i think as you mentioned earlier it's uh Definitely, I think the cook's role is so undervalued. And the thing is, the cook is preparing the life-giving food. Like people should really mm -hmm. thank the chef because mm -hmm. otherwise, you know, you're eating a frozen pizza or you're, you know, going through a drive through and you're just eating food that is, you know, kind of ultra processed, packaged, you mm -hmm. know, a, a restaurant food is made from a human. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Absolutely. And I don't know. I just think it's such an undervalued uh, role in so many, you know, in so many places. Just I think the front of house staff, they get the big tips. They get they're the face of everything mm -hmm. like they're the mm -hmm. face of the, the kitchen. They're the face of the, the establishment, but they're not making the food. So, I mean, I, I think it's it all fits. But uh, as a general manager, you, you kind of have to, you know, make sure everybody is um doing their part and their part, keeping the yeah. customers coming back. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. And that's uh, to be specific about my current situation. I mean, that's where we're fortunate being part of such a great community and having such a great community backing. We do see quite a few new customers coming through, but the amount of regular faces that come and support every day, that, that certainly is a game changer for us in that particular situation. Oh yeah. The loyal, like just having, you know, people that come back, over it. it just shows like it's a testament to the character of the pub and mm -hmm. just the history and obviously the atmosphere and just every part of it. I, I mean, the entertainment is a big part of it, it sounds like, and must be comfortable seating and, you know, clean and good food, all the stuff. So value for money. So you've got like all those elements that are showing that people love it and it's been around for 40 years like that's incredible mm -hmm. so many places mm -hmm. you know went under in the last couple of years through the pandemic and absolutely for, you know cobblestone pub to keep going that's just that's amazing yeah and, and you know it was a grind for sure um it was really unfortunate for a lot of people to lose their livelihoods in that fashion and the uh yeah the community certainly kept us alive <laughs> over the past few years i mean well for as long as we've been open but definitely through the past multiple yeah. years Oh, totally. Yeah. Hey, Brent, how often do you guys have to change your menu? Um, or do you find that people are happy to be ordering the same thing over and over again? And I know you said you have specials once in a while, but is, is there like a, do you find there's just like the same things being ordered? Like you got your hot items kind of thing? Well, we, we generally do a menu tweak or change about twice a year. And is, it, is that out of necessity or just like, what's well, the yeah, reason we for like the to, menu change? We, we try and keep it to seasonality a little bit uh right. so we'll, we'll usually change going into summer and then going into winter just to try and you know bring in some you know more warm home feel type of menu items um and then going to the summer some fresher things lighter things some, some bit more salads in that regard right. people come out of hibernation looking to 
get beach body beautiful again in the summer. <laughs> 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 um, so, so yeah, season, uh, seasonally, we try and do it twice a year. We, again, try and keep up. We run probably about five to six feature items a week on a weekly basis, just to, again, to have those different options for the people who are coming in, you know, three, four times a week that you know, they'll usually get their, their mainstay, but every now and then they're like, oh, I'll try and switch it up. <laughs> right. And that's where we try and keep things, you know, a little bit more vibrant, a little more in the moment with regards to what the season is. So things are super summer focused right now. When we go into fall, it will be certainly fall, winter, and then spring. We start changing things are, up again. Are you limited? Because you're a pub, right? And is that, mm-hmm. I don't know what the, the, like the actual definition of a pub is, but does that define kind of what your menu items can and can't be? Maybe historically, I don't necessarily believe that it is. You know, I mean, I think there's, you know, people when they go to a pub, they want good nachos, they want good wings, um, yeah, things along those lines. But we've got a pretty, well, in this uh, specific instance where I'm working, we've got a pretty diverse menu. You know, we've got uh, quite a few global bowls is what we call them, stir fries and different things like that. We've got nice. our burgers, we've got our wings, we've got our, uh, some great steak dinners, we run prime rib dinners. And so, I mean, we, we are trying to elevate sort of what the maybe the general thought behind what pub food is uh, you're like i think a, you're like a pub plus yeah right <laughs> <laughs> exactly I, I think people call it like well not this one but this type of what we're aiming for like a gastro pub so it's, oh, okay. it's a little oh. more fancy with regards to what we're the offerings we're trying to do we're not we're not trying to fall back into the 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 cave age of you know just yeah you know what you expect of pub kind of right meat, meat yeah. and deep fried that's right yeah or just like <laughs> exactly. yeah burger and wings yeah mm-hmm. no gastro pub that's interesting so it's kind of a new offshoot of more it's so a pub to me means like really good drinks and then you got some pub food but mm-hmm. then the gastro pub sounds like it's really kind of uh diversifying the menu and getting more of the food focus to match with drinks and Exactly right. Yeah, absolutely. It uh, it just opens up the the box a little bit with regards to what you can try and do, and and people will, you know, maybe it probably just comes down to a marketing thing. So you can raise your prices a little bit more because you you sound fancier, but the right. food does also <laughs> accompany that as well. Um, <laughs> and I mean, we we are classified as a pub, but internally we strive to offer things that are above and beyond what you would normally expect. Right. Oh, when you're making the menu, mm-hmm. in terms of priorities, like, like let's say um, price, like cost, cost of your supplies, mm-hmm. the health aspects, how uh, appealing it is, I guess, to the customers, and then how appealing it is for for the the kitchen staff. Mm-hmm. What's kind of top priority, or how do you factor all those things into? You know, obviously the restaurant needs to make money as a business, but. Mm-hmm you know, you want, you want to serve healthy food and you know, this, it's a lot of things. It's kind of like what Sandra asked you in the beginning. It's, Mm -hmm. there's a lot of things to kind of balance out. You just kind of figure it out or is there sort of a a formula or a a priority that's, you know, cost is number one and everything else falls into place or how does that all work? Well, I I think you need to start with value with what your, what your offering is going to be. And, you know, everyone, eats with their eyes first, you know, so if you get, if you're paying 25 bucks and you get a, a cucumber and a dill sprig, you know, people aren't <laughs> going to be all that thrilled about it and right. you might be making a great profit, but the value isn't there. So if you can start with value and then base your costing off around that and, and find the ingredients that, uh, I'll take like a cheddar slice, for example, you can get a, a cheddar slice that costs you $2 and 50 cents, or you can find one that's 35 cents kind of thing, right? Depending on the quality and and who's trying to sell it to you. So, I mean, when you get into the finer dining establishments where the prices reflect the total environment and then what you're getting, you know, that's why you have the higher end prices because you're getting like the top quality product. And with, you know, so yeah, I mean, starting with value and then building your costs around that to try and make sure that when the bottom line hits, on, on your uh, profit loss statements that yeah, you're making that profit, but you're still offering the value for people to come in and, and feel comfortable spending their hard-earned money, especially these days, because it's not cheap yeah. to go out to eat anymore. Yeah, no Absolutely. kidding. Yeah, yeah, no, that's awesome. And always having those healthy items like the grilled chicken and the salads and that's the, right. yeah. you know, ra- veggie wraps and just things that are um, options for vegetarians, or I'm sure that all has to play into how you devise the menu. 
Yeah, absolutely. And some areas are like to be like specific with like the vegetarian things. I mean, yeah, you always need to have one or two things again, depending on your location. I think you might offer more of those types of items or less depending on where you are. Right. I know that, uh, you know, you go to Victoria, there will be a plethora of <laughs> different options for all the different <laughs> types of uh, uh, diets and, and things that people need to, in order to survive these days. And then, you know, you get into a smaller community where maybe people aren't too concerned and they just want their meat and potatoes and, right. and, and that works for them as well. Yeah, that makes sense. Totally. So tell us, uh, actually, we kind of know the answer, but we have lots of <laughs> listeners here that are, I'm sure, interested. It is something we ask all our guests. If you were going to go to a potluck, what dish would you bring? Oh, well, I generally like to either do something slow cooked on the barbecue and more recently, um, as you both are aware, I, uh, I, I go to uh, shrimp ceviche. It, uh, mm. It's one of my favorite things and uh, it's been well received when I've brought sure it to has. potlucks recently. So, <laughs> <laughs> so good. <laughs> is it pretty quick to put together, Brent? It really is. Um, it seems, yeah, like it would the, be. It, it's a bit of dicing and, and stuff of vegetables and, and fruit, but otherwise it's you squeeze some limes, lemons, and an orange and let it the shrimp sit in that for about half an hour to an hour, depending on how much shrimp you have, and, and then throw everything together. It's kind of like a nice little shrimp salsa. Yeah, oh, <laughs> exactly. it's so good. Oh, my God. Your family's so lucky. <laughs> 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 you get so- they really aren't because they don't get it at home they don't <laughs> get it at the potluck <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> just funny. at the potlucks yeah. just for family and friends <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome oh my goodness well rob is there any other questions that you uh might have there i think uh i think we covered sort of the basics hey eh? like got most of our uh most of our questions answered yeah, like a snapshot yeah. in the, you know, of the kitchen in a busy restaurant pub, like just, wow, I, I you know, I just, I applause you guys, because it's, um, that environment is so high energy and fast paced that I feel like you need to be young to do that. <laughs> it, it yeah, it certainly, oh no, it doesn't. <laughs> i think it's like a dog years thing if you work oh, no. <laughs> yeah, totally. depending on how well you can take care of yourself outside of it um yeah, right. yeah i know it certainly it, yeah it's a it's a daily workout and it it, it age does play a, a role as you as the years carry on you certainly start feeling things differently and the ability to I'll say balance and keep your cool. Keep your cool. Uh, that, yeah, that's that right. threshold gets yeah. a little bit thinner every year. It seems. Yeah. <laughs> what's the uh, What's the go to at the uh, the cobblestone? It's the cobblestone pub. Is that what it's called? That's correct. The cobblestone pub. As far as as menu items. Well, like, what's the hot selling item? Is there is there one or is there a few or like like I like to go in and and I'll say to I'll say to the server like, what do you recommend? And yeah. what's their what's their answer going to be? That's a good one. We've got a you know. The menu, like I said, it's pretty diverse, but it's a uh, bestseller, maybe. How are the nachos? Again, I like my nachos. The nachos are deadly. And okay, the, actually, the nachos just turned, we, we changed them a little bit into a Mexicano nacho. Yeah. So uh, mm-hmm. it's like a black bean, corn salsa, avocado, tomato, queso fresco cheese, uh, mm-hmm. lime, jalapeno, sour cream. They've, so, uh, yeah. They're a big hit for sure. I, I would be sold on that. Yeah. Yeah. yeah totally. <laughs> and yeah, you know, it, it's a tough question, Rob, uh, in this specific instance, because, you know, it's everything seems to move really well. Yeah. Everyone has their favorite. So it's hard to, For I, sure, I, yeah. but, you know, our, our beef dip is deadly. I would say that it's probably one of the best ones in the couch and valley uh, mm. for for the value and for what you're paying for it. Oh. Our stir fries are super popular as well. And they're, you know, it's chow mein noodles some veggies and we've we've got a pork chow mein a sweet and sour prawn and a almond chicken and those are yeah those are always selling pretty and that seems different than um you know a kind of traditional pub food a stir fry like that's awesome totally Mm -hmm. absolutely and that's been i think those ones have been on the menu for years that was (laughs) the i think the original chef before i got involved in this particular location had that on the menu for number of years he's like you can't take that one off (laughs) he's like it's got good value and it's cheap 
<laughs> yeah, that's awesome. <laughs> it's tasty and it's a yeah, seller. Yeah, exactly. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, it's pretty simple, but yeah, people love them. I guess you see some trends change over the years, hey? I mean, like like back in the day, maybe it was chicken wings, but now, like you say, it's it's the, the potato skins. Do you or, remember potato oh, yeah, skins? Potato skins, oh, absolutely. <laughs> and, and you know, that's the crazy thing with, with chicken wings. They, they used to be considered garbage, and that's why in the processing plants they would basically just get tossed out they was there was no use for them uh oh, and I, don't, I, I don't know who exactly came up with the idea to start frying them but uh it, that's why you're able used to be able to get like 25 cent wings and, <gasps> but now because they're such a hot ticket item i mean we, i think you, that is so like interesting five dollars so- a pound for wings right now oh wow oh my gosh and that's at cost yeah <sighs> because there's a demand it's a supply and demand yeah. right absolutely absolutely <sighs> Wow, funny. that is so interesting. So it used to be just something they were tossing out because they didn't yeah, use that part of the by, chicken. It was a byproduct. It might have gotten ground down into something the, uh, dog to food. process into meal. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, but it, it wasn't necessarily something that was offered in a in a restaurant environment. And I again, I don't know exactly. People drinking beer will eat it. Right? Yeah, right. Yeah. Yeah, we'll sell them <laughs> sell them off for twenty five cents each. There, there are three beers in. They'll have them, no problem. <laughs> and, and you know, I mean, that's that's. Uh, I think that's what speaks to some of the genius of, of uh, chefs is, you know, you need to come up with ideas to how to use products that you wouldn't necessarily be able to sell True. for, for, for good price or any price at all. And right. uh, totally. the best chefs are, are the ones who can come up with those types of, or the, or the box thinking. Absolutely. Sure. I love that. Yeah. Yeah. Cause that's the thing too. I mean, um, I think there's so many people that think, you know, you can't combine this food and this food together, or this isn't considered a lunch item or whatever. And it's yeah. like, really food can be anything you want. Like you can just mm-hmm. do whatever you want, like be creative. Cause that's like, you know, it, if it tastes good at the end of the day and people eat it, that's yeah, that's awesome. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I, I think cooking has got lost in, in generally in society because, you know, there's so many options to go out and eat. And um, I think I think that skill has kind of fallen by the wayside for a lot of younger people, I would say. Yes. Just because of the it, it's, everything's so easy. <laughs> I can pick up the phone. I'll have, you know, Uber or not Uber, but Uber Eats will de- deliver it to me kind of thing. Totally. I don't even have to leave my yeah. house. Um, and, you know, you get into those types of situations and you're paying twice as much than you normally would almost that going out to eat where you could have maybe just whipped up something in the kitchen and then people are get super dependent on recipes rather than, you know, like you said, being creative and having some fun and exploring and trying to figure out what happens when you mix that with that. <laughs> that's that's exactly. kind of our, our message with the podcast is because that's how I cook and, and, yeah. and we're trying to convince people that, uh, you know, don't be afraid to try things and just throw it together and see what happens. Mm-hmm. You know, what's the worst mm-hmm. that can happen? It doesn't taste yeah. good or you, th- you throw it away or whatever. But I mean, it's like, it's not going to kill you. No, so no, it's, no, it's no. worth trying and figuring things out. It's, uh, yeah. but it's so intimidating. And at the end of the day, you'll, you'll have learned something, right? Exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. That's right. And maybe you'll, you'll be the next person who comes up with chicken wings. It's like. The- right. Exactly. <laughs> The most like uh, most popular item at a pub. That's so funny. Yeah, that is wow. funny. Yeah, it's a good story. Jeez, <laughs> holy! Well, thank you so much, Brent. This is great, and I really hope that Sunday or the um, anniversary this weekend coming up for the for the pub cobblestone pub goes really well. I'm sure it will. Yes, All thank you very much. we and- yeah. The uh, the build up is a little bit intense, but we're looking forward to it. I bet. <laughs> Just trying to get all of our T's crossed and O's dotted. <laughs> ah, nice. Yeah. That's right. Oh my gosh! Yeah, it's amazing uh, that you could take some time uh, before that big event to talk to us today, and uh, we really thank you again that. for having me on. This is fun. I, uh, <laughs> yeah, certainly new to me, but lots of fun. <laughs> right on. That's awesome. Thanks for joining us today, Brent. We'll talk to you again soon. Sounds great. Thanks again. Okay. All right. Bye. Wow, that was so interesting. Yeah, it's there's a lot more to it than meets the eye. Oh yeah. Oh my gosh. All the you know the high pressure atmosphere in the kitchen and the different personality of of the chefs working in the kitchen and trying to uh, prepare awesome meals for the customers and then the outrageous requests of the customers that the servers bring in. Yeah, it's so that's, funny. That's kind of a new thing, I bet. You know, I mean, like thirty years ago, I don't think they they had to deal with as many oddball kind of requests as they do nowadays. There's yeah. just so many different 
the eggless omelet and then yeah yeah <laughs> and then the cool like history of the chicken wing and now that it's like the favorite pub item and just how it used to be just a byproduct that was thrown in the trash and they, like hey let's serve it to people and then people love it yeah no that's so cool the, the the history of things um when i was younger like in back in school i used to work at pizza hut and I was a waiter for most of it, but then I I was there long enough that I wanted some more shifts and I ended up working in the kitchen and it was a completely different scene. And it was nice sometimes because you you could just, you put on a different face. Well, you didn't have to put a face on at all. Like when you're serving people, you have to come in with a smile on regardless of what mood you're in. And, and so it was a nice change to be in the kitchen because it's like, okay, I'm in a grumpy mood today and I can be grumpy because no one's, no one's going to see me. And the funny thing, talking about like the busy Friday night, you know, the pizzas are on a, on an oven that's on a conveyor belt. And so you put them in one end and they come out the other end. And the guy who's on the, the other end of the oven, he's pulling those things out and cutting them and throwing them on the tray. And if he's not keeping up, they're falling off the conveyor belt because there's so many going through at once. So the high pace you know, I've been there. I've been that guy. And I totally get that. It's, it's crazy. You just like, go, 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 go. And you, you know, you don't even have time to sip your water. It's just, or, you know, pizzas are going to be falling on the floor. Absolutely. Yeah. It's so interesting. I mean, I was a waitress in so many different restaurants, um, through high school and university. And I was always at the front of the the house. You were the smiley face that greeted everyone. and Yeah. Yeah. And uh, always that relationship with the cooks and, um, you know, ordering food for the customers and talking to the chefs and you could d- see the different personalities. And Where's you, my burger yeah. for table 33? <laughs> That's not how I was. I was always really nice because I know that they're under pressure. And Excuse we, me, you where's know. my burger for table 33? <laughs> no, it was never like that. Not like that. No, none of the above. No, no, no. But now it's interesting because it's a different role for me working as a dietitian in, you know, long-term care homes where there's kitchens and the pace is a lot different for the cooks for sure. But it's just, um, it's so interesting to get a perspective from the people preparing the food. Oh, for sure. It's a, it's a high energy and high stress job. Yeah. And, and it's, and there's a time on it too, you know, like that's, that's where the stress and, and, uh, comes in. Especially if it's something that has to be hot when it goes out or, yeah. you know, it's, uh, Yeah. Yeah. So kudos, kudos to all you, uh, kitchen, kitchen people and chefs and cooks and, uh, you know, yeah. A round of applause for you all because you deserve it. And thanks so much to Brent for bringing his expertise and his knowledge and his information for us and the listeners, because that was just a really cool perspective. And I know it was something different than what we normally do, but we thought it would be such an interesting and fun interview and discussion about the cooking in the kitchen yeah yeah thanks brent for uh for sharing your stories with us those were those were fun to hear so stay with us for wednesday we'll be back with nutrition nuggets on wednesday we're going to dive into the mailbag again and answer another question we're getting all sorts of emails these days so we'll uh we'll address a few of the questions that have come through uh that'll be wednesday And don't forget to check out our social media pages, um, YouTube, Instagram, and Facebook. We've got new stuff coming up there all the time, as well as our website. Uh, There's new blog articles on there. Uh, That's mywifethedietitian.com. If you haven't been there, check that out. And if you have questions you'd like to fire at us, you can reach us through our email at mywifetherd at gmail.com. And don't forget to rate and review the show. That always helps us move things forward and get more people listening and yeah, it's good for good for everyone. And we have some really awesome guests lined up, which uh, is exciting. We have the author of Becoming Vegetarian, Vicento Molino, coming up in August. And in the next few weeks, we have Katie Seaton from Eat, Swim, Win. And also we talk to Lizzie Briasco about retired athletes and people that are transitioning from being an, a marathon runner and athlete to the next stage of life where they need to reframe their mindset around uh, health and wellness goals that are different than winning the gold. Yeah, sounds like some interesting stuff coming up. So we will keep you posted on those. And in the meantime, have a great week, everyone. Thanks for tuning in today. 
Thanks for joining us today on My Wife the Dietitian. If you like what you heard, don't be shy. Leave us a comment or review and be sure to share our podcast with your friends. If you'd like to hear more, hit that subscribe button. You can also follow us on our social media pages for updates, episode trailers, and other odds and ends. For more info and links on what we discussed on today's episode, check the show notes. We'll be back next week with another informative and fun-filled episode. Thank you.